Okay. So we get started? Let's we'll be back quite a bit. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you want to pray? Uh, yeah, I can pray. Yeah. Dear Father, thank you for this day and yeah, just how we can spend time in a community of other believers, how we can dive deep into your word and learn more about the truth that you've, you've prepared for us. Um, thank you again for this day and uh, pray that uh, we'll have a, have a good time of, of learning and discussion. We love you, and in Jesus' name, amen. It depends on if going to be on the podcast. Just walk right in front of I would highly <laughs> recommend going in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit right here. All right, God. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so this class uh, is all about Mormonism. Are they Christians? How compatible is it with what we believe with what the Bible teaches? And also history, structure, how can you maybe best witness to a Mormon um, all that sort of stuff. So, so before we start, we got no Mormons here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys ever met them? Yeah. We're actually trying to convince them to be Mormon. So. so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is is one of you guys pro Mormon? Yeah. It's going to be a debate. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So a little bit about the history. Founded by Joseph Smith in the uh, early to mid 1920s or 1820s, I should say, and uh, the Book of Mormon was first published in the 1830s, then Joseph Smith ended up, well, they ended up having to move from western New York state, uh, moved a bunch of different places, Missouri, then well, Ohio, then Missouri, then Illinois, and then that's where Joseph Smith was murdered in the uh, 1840s. They had a whole weird secession crisis that happened uh, where there's currently like five different Mormon churches that all claim to be the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, but now the largest one resides in Utah. Um, it's headquartered in Salt Lake City. And yeah, so after Smith was murdered, this guy named Brigham Young takes over the mainstream line of the Mormon church. And he then founds this uh, construct in the Mormon church called the Twelve Apostles um, and uh, then also they settled in, in Utah so so is that like the church structure of the Twelve Apostles yeah so there's uh, that's the, actually in the next slide oh, um, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah there's they have lots of weird legal things in between because Brigham Young was very politically active at the time and so when they moved to Utah he lobbied Congress to make a whole state um, which then ended up not being the state that he lobbied Congress for. They ended up creating the Utah Territories as a part of the Compromise of 1850 because obviously slavery, anti-abolitionist uh, movements were very uh, clashing mm -hmm. <laughs> at the time. And he was the first governor of the Utah Territory. Um, and yeah, now New Mormon Church is over 16 million members. Uh, all sorts of weird things about the Mormon church that you can go into. Some you will like, some you will absolutely hate. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, as far as its current structure, it is a authoritative church, meaning that everything that the church leaders say are binding on their members. If you don't follow what church leaders say, then you may be kicked out of the church or you have to go through what a uh, 1970s uh, sermon called the courts of love uh, <laughs> anyway uh, they have their as far as their structure goes the leader of the church is called the president and he is a part of what's called the first presidency him and two other apostles are counselors to him and the president is the highest ranking official in the entire mormon church and also the highest ranking office in the entire mormon church so are the apostles like vice president then? Yeah, essentially. Okay. So then you have the 12 apostles, which them, they can make decisions collectively as well, but they're only the second highest ranking office in the entire Mormon church. So uh, if something has to be specified throughout the entire church, it is said by the president, um, and he has advisors who are apostles, and then also 12 or, well, 10 other, well, Actually, nine other apostles, because the president himself is also an apostle. Huh. Ah. Um, so, if the president said something, and there's like a disagreement between them and the apostles, do you know like what happened? The, so, it, it, 
That hasn't really happened, but yeah. when it comes down to it, the president wins. The president wins. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of weird. And then there's also the, the 70, which is uh, more of a administrative um, group of men, once again, who uh, administrate different things, whether it's the finances, whether it's missions, whether it's you know community efforts, uh, internal organization, uh, that's all right. Yes. So would you say that sounds pretty similar to the Roman Catholic Church structure? Yeah, actually, oh, um, kind of fairly. Yeah, as especially as far as you have like a someone who's similar to the Pope. You have cardinals. Uh, so, well, the twelve apostles are somewhat similar to the cardinals, and then uh, the seventy would basically just be other bishops and uh, high-ranking officials throughout the the church. So hmm. it's not exactly the same because cardinals themselves are simply just regular bishops who then get to vote on the presidency, or vote on the, the papacy, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, but in the Mormon church, it is uh, definitely <laughs> similar. So, That's any other questions? No? Cool. Well, we'll, we'll move on to what uh, some things that they believe that we would consider heresies. Yeah. And not everything that we're going to show throughout uh, this session are really true heresies. There's kind of levels on um, like directly contradicts what the Bible teaches, and then others are just interesting additions that they provide. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so <laughs> we're gonna probably tag team this a little bit because Cal has actually done quite a bit of research on what they believe, and um, I've done quite a bit of research on the other ones. I think heresies are really interesting in the search. So, um, so first of all, does anyone actually know what heresy is before we just like dive into it? So. Anyone? Has anyone heard that word before? Heresy? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's our favorite word. <laughs> That's okay. okay. So, so heresy is actually his favorite word. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's his favorite word. Yeah, the Lisa makes fun of me that when I that that's like my favorite word, and she teaches me it in Portuguese, so she's like, "But is it here, see ya? Here, see ya. Yep, every Sunday, every Sunday. Every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, heresy is actually a little bit debated in the church of what it is. So in the Catholic Church, heresy, which is where it historically came from, would just be anything that the, the Catholic Church doesn't agree with, right? Yeah. Um, but for Protestants, for us, it's more of like since that we're very individualistic, instead of having a uh, you know. A church structure and overarching church structure yeah. is it's kind of like if this is what everyone believes it's probably true you know what i mean so like we all believe in the trinity and to say that the trinity isn't true would be considered heresy right yeah. and then the catholics would take that as well so i'm going to use it pretty broadly in this sense and when i'm talking about the church disagreeing i'm literally talking about all of protestantism all right like this is not something that we disagree on it's not like Calvinism versus Arminianism or anything like that it's like we all agree okay yeah right. um so the first one is we're gonna go over it's called tritheism it's a very old heresy it goes back to the first century actually um I think probably the best way to do it do you want to explain what the Mormons believe first sure I can get into that yeah so the Mormons believe that uh, God the Father Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are three different persons but also three different essences meaning that they are not one in any sense of the term. They are, they are three different distinct parts that come together to form the Godhead. Um, and this goes back to actually the very first <coughs> revelation that Joseph Smith had was a vision of him seeing God the Father on a physical body and Jesus Christ who also has a physical body. And so in their Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of their holy scriptures, uh, it states, the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. So, um, yeah, they believe that God the Father has a physical body, mm -hmm. that Jesus Christ also has a physical body, and that the Holy Spirit does not. Um, and then, to that point, they also believe <laughs> how Jesus Christ is in some way born of God the Father because he inherits attributes from God the Father. Uh, so they're not, they don't just simply possess the same attributes and qualities, rather that Jesus Christ inherits those from God the Father, aka he is born of God. So they so believe- is Jesus deity to the Mormons? So they believe that he is, um, as, but they, see, it's weird to nail down a particular answer because they, kind of flip back and forth and they try to make 
their presentation of their theology as compatible as possible with uh, the, Protest the yeah. Protestant view. Um, so they would say, yes, Jesus Christ is deity, but they would also caveat that by saying he's not the same as God the Father. He is simply part of the Godhead. So they're like pieces of a pie? Good. Yeah, yeah a great exactly. analogy. Um, okay. Piece of the pie. Good. I think they believe Jesus was originally human, right? And then he ascended or like mm, was able to be called? That's, 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 that's true. Not that's necessarily, yes. Okay. So in their view, they have a thing, they have a particular doctrine called pre-mortal existence. So they believe everyone has existed eternally as spirits, uh, and that as part of this story, we are granted mortality as a way to become closer to God. Um, in the case of Jesus Christ, he is actually the spirit offspring of God the Father and what they call the spirit mother. Um, the spirit Holy Spirit? I, no, good question. <laughs> that is a good question, but no, it's not the Holy Spirit. Um, so, so. Yeah. And then, of course, then you have that coming together again with God the Father and uh, the Virgin Mary is what they would claim, so, with so, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you uh, got, um, it's already mentioned, maybe it's not the same way it was mentioned, that they acknowledge Jesus but they, but he's a little lower than the Holy Spirit, God of Father. Yeah, exactly, yep. exactly. exactly. Right. He is a lesser kind of deity simply because he is born of God the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, he, AKA, he was created by God the Father in, in some way or another. So, cool. Yeah. So you guys got that kind of what they believe generally. So, um, does anyone know? So, this is very important to Christianity. First of all, the Trinity is an essential doctrine to what we believe. Um, does anyone know actually how to explain the Trinity? Because um, people have tried multiple times, like you said, there's like the piece of the pie that historically has been held as the heresy of tritheism right here. So um, the Trinity, if nobody wants to say it, is, go ahead and go for it. It's three godheads who equal one god. That, yeah, that, that would be a good way to say it, yeah. Historically it's been said three persons and um, one essence or one God as well, so like you're not wrong by saying it that way either. But, um, and that's very convoluted. I'm actually, when Cal's going to be gone next week, I'm thinking about doing a full class in the Trinity so we can really break it out and see what the Bible believes. But um, to go through it quickly, the easiest way to argue for the Trinity is to apply attributes to, to the all three persons of the Trinity that can only be applied to God. And then, um, for specifically Jesus, applying attributes that can't be applied to God can only be applied to human. And then see uh, the the difference between uh, Jesus's humanness and his um, his God Godness, <laughs> yeah. I guess, right? So, just real quickly, if we have John one one, it's that Jesus is God, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very just explicitly says that yeah. Jesus was God. It, it doesn't say right. Jesus was a God. It says Jesus was, was God. God. Yeah. And then if we contrast that with that exact point with First Timothy two five, it says, uh, "For there is one God." who has been given as, um, uh, for there is one God, there is also one mediator, mediator between God and humankind, Jesus Christ, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. So we have two seemingly contradictory statements, right? And that's why we have to hold the Trinity as three persons, but one God. This is not that. This is three gods, all right? So this is contrary to that. And as you said, people have tried to explain the Trinity in maybe metaphors that we can explain it a lot, classic one is like, um, he's like a three-leaf clover, right? Or he's uh, three pieces of a pie. But this isn't true because the three different pieces of the pie are actually three different things, right? And God is all one essence. So it's pretty philosophical there, but that's why we would brand this as heresy, and specifically a very old heresy has been uh, argued against a lot throughout the church. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess, does anyone have questions on that? No, yeah, I think that was pretty straightforward. This is yeah. my favorite one right here. So yeah. Do you want to explain what they believe? Here? Sure, yeah, so uh, they believe in an open canon. That means, uh, but more specifically, they believe that God revealed new scripture in the 1800s um, yeah. through their prophet Joseph Smith and then through additional prophets uh, because they believe that um, the president is a prophet as well. So there's always a prophet in the church. Um, they currently have four different holy books, uh, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. 
Um, and they kind of publish all those one together collectively as the Word of God. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like I said, the, their president is considered a prophet, so God could theoretically continue speaking through their prophet even today, um, right. should he have something to reveal. So. Yeah, all right, so this is a, this is a big one for Christianity. Um, I guess, first of all, um, how do we know that scripture is true is a very important question that we should ask, especially as Christians that first come into Christianity. Uh, my personal view is that we should be highly skeptical of anything that we go into, um, maybe not to the point of like some philosophers like Hume or those people would say, but um, we should come on it with as much scrutiny as possible and try to disprove it. And if we can't disprove it, the next logical step is to accept it, right? So Christianity, one of the main ways that we know that it's true is that the Bible is what's called self-attesting. So there's no contradictions in the Bible that we can tell. We went over that in our first class. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing about that, so, so first of all, contradictions is a big thing. So if we find contradictions, that would immediately say that faith is not real, right? It can't be true. So um, a good example of that is, is Mormonism and a lot of these cults. A lot of them have contradictions. Yeah. Um, the three major religions are much harder for contradictions, right? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so that's partially why so many people believe them, yeah. right? Um, so, so that's one way that we can kind of deduce that. The second question then is what is scripture? That's, that's actually a big question that we should ask. Um, and how do we know what scripture is? So does anyone know uh, how we know what should be in scripture and what shouldn't be in scripture? Like if someone came to like the church today, the Mormon church, and said, I just got a word from God, this needs to be in scripture. How would we know that that's not true? The Council of Nicaea is that? The Council of Nicaea was one of the councils that got together. Um, that actually, specifically, it was to get rid of this heresy right here. Yeah, uh, I don't know that they so. confronted uh, the canon specifically. Yeah, well, they didn't in that one. That was more about the Trinity. But um, how would we know? That's a different question of whether it's closed or open. But how would we know if someone came to us, first of all, and said, um, like, I got a word from God, and God told me to tell you to do this, or he told me to... I wrote another book, I wrote, wrote the Book of Mormon, and this is inherent scripture. How would we know whether to trust them or not? Because that's a real question, people do this all the time. Yeah. You know, does anyone... Do you just dismiss them out of hand, being like, well, no, Revelation was right. written, and that's, that's it? Yep. Or do you... Give it credence. Give, a, give it some credence. Mm -hmm. And compare it to scripture. Exactly. You can compare it to scripture, yeah. But um, I guess the question I'm trying to go towards more is even in scripture, like the New Testament was written and that was new and they accepted it. But the key that comes with new scripture and everywhere in the Bible, it's actually miracles. Um, it's pretty interesting that there's only uh, three timelines in the Bible or three time periods where miracles actually take place. And when I say miracles, I'm not talking about like, um, you know, God working within the physics of, of the universe today, but I'm talking about things like parting the Red Sea, right? Like, uh, God bringing down fire from heaven and lighting the altar. All right, these God does these miracles very specifically to um, add to scripture, basically, to bring new revelation. So three periods you have uh, Moses, right? So Moses was given direct power from God to be able to work miracles. Um, it seems pretty much freely. You have um, the middle prophets, so you're going to have Elijah and Elisha of those ones, and then you're going to have the apostles, right? All those time periods were direct miracles. They could do whatever they wanted. I mean, you have people that were touching the robes of Paul and they would become healed, right? We don't really see that today. So when we see someone like this that comes in and says, I have a word from God, you know, this is what it is, we should honestly expect to see partings of the Red Sea and healings and all these sorts of speaking in tongues and the, in their languages and these sorts of things as well. So um, that's one of the arguments. There's many other arguments as well. Uh, yeah. In Protestantism, the charismatic church would just very much disagree completely with what I just said. <laughs> but um, the Reformed traditions and the Baptist traditions in our church right here would, would agree with that. Yeah. And what I would say as well is, with respect to Mormonism specifically, you really do just need to compare it with what the Bible states. Because the, in the Pearl of Great Price, for example, the first history that Joseph Smith records, like his, basically his experience and how he came to the vision and then ended up finding, you know, the Book of Mormon, he just states straight out, like, well, I saw uh, two people, you know, standing there with physical bodies. One was God yeah. the Father uh -huh. and one was Jesus Christ. It's like, okay, so from the very inception of Mormonism, 
you have a heresy right. uh, that God the Father has a physical body, that he resides in a you know, very specific place that he's not omniscient. In yeah, yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, I, my, I'm actually about to get into that right here. So, okay, cool. so Mormonism is actually a little bit easier to even argue against than that. So, um, because other religions, like Judaism is a perfect example, I mean, that's the Old Testament as well. They, mm -hmm. they claim to be true, we claim to be true as well. So, the, the, the easiest one to argue against is contradictions, because we can't have logical contradictions in the Bible. And if you notice here, the Bible is on their, their holy books, that's an error, right? So if this contradicts any of these, the whole religion has to be thrown out. It just does, it doesn't make sense. Did they anyway. rewrite really the Bible? Um, no, okay. not exactly. So they used the King James Version, 1611, and they, I see, I, I'm not exactly certain about this. I believe they might have revised it to some degree to match more closely with the Book of Mormon, I feel like but I'm not exactly sure about yeah. that. Um, I do know that they add emphasis in certain places where they want you to maybe take a different interpretation, but otherwise, just from the passages that I've looked at, it matches with the King James Version. Um, at the same time, what they will argue is that it's not necessarily as the Bible it, as we have today in English is not as reliable as the Book of Mormon or other books that they have. Mm -hmm. Of course. Right. Because, <laughs> yeah, because they argue uh, church corruption happened in the second century AD. That's right. Yeah. And um, as a result of that, all of the originals uh we, well, they would claim we don't have any original scripture uh, from the New Testament. We only have derivatives of that, and those are corrupted from the originals. And the, claim, I'd but. say that the you know the point about miracles is, is, is pretty significant it's because significant. Mm -hmm. the you know in the Bible um, it lays out different ways that we can come to faith, and it talks about in, uh, like in Romans, it's like it's obvious because of the creation, and then then there's the idea of historically looking at. The, the Word of God in the Bible and kind of does it fit history mm -hmm. um, and can it be verified? Mm -hmm. And then so you keep then people can speak into your life. So it's just all these things collectively. Yeah. And the idea about miracles is where every example of miracles was very public. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. very consistent. It was yeah. very obvious. And it was meant to be this wide look at our credibility because the power of God. Yeah, this is, is yeah. so different from. A little lady standing out of her wheelchair in a, in a Bible, um, or you know something that like this that that you immediately your radar comes up is like that seems very easily um, duplicated or yeah. um, you know can be pretended. Yeah. Uh, to where it, all the ones in the Bible that that's not too many people. I think yeah. I think your point that you're you're nailing is that um, for for us to really we should be highly skeptical. As I'm saying right. For us to really believe something as seemingly outrageous as these miracles that we see in the Bible, see in the Bible, right? Like, we want to have a lot of evidence for that, okay? And in the Bible, like nobody really doubted that the, the Red Sea was parted, right? Like everyone around knew of that story, you know. Everyone in even enemies, of even enemies, Israel, right? right? Yeah, they were like they believed in their gods, but they're like, wow, this god is really powerful. <laughs> so look what he's doing, that, right? So, so we have that yeah. in the New Testament as well. These were very learned people. Uh, many of the Greeks were atheists, right? Or, uh, or some weird version of uh, dualism, and they were highly skeptical people as well. You know, a lot of them came into Christianity because of that. So, this is not falsifiable, right? There's no, there's no way when Joseph Smith goes into the woods and then yeah. comes out with this book that he has and says this is the word of God. You can't really check that. You know, there's not the Red Sea parting. Yeah, the only things way to well. check it really is its character. Is its character, uh, yep. and that's the thing is from a Christian theological point of view, like a Protestant theological point of view no one really believes that the canon is completely closed. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're going to argue more about this dispensation and what has been revealed point. when a new revelation might come and what you might see along with that, right? Like, mm -hmm. as, as to your point. Yeah. Um, when it does come, it'll be obvious. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, when, you know, Jesus comes, sits on the millennial kingdom, does anyone really believe that he won't say anything worth writing down? No, he'll say tons of things worth writing down, and that's why we don't believe the canon is completely yeah. closed. Yeah, I've, I've heard one argument that it should be closed in Revelation. It says if anyone adds to this book, um, then it should be closed. But I've, I've, I mean, I don't really want to get into it, but I'm not convinced that that's talking about the whole Bible. I'm more convinced that's talking about the book of Revelation. Yeah. Um, but 
Anyway, so we're talking about Mormons, so I'm going to get back to that. So, real quickly, to go some of, through some of the contradictions that we have between the Bible here and other ones here, the Doctrine of Covenants, um, 130 22, says that God has a body. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, I, I don't actually have the exact translation there, but take my word for it. <laughs> and then um, the Bible has numerous examples of God not having a body. One is John 4.24, which explicitly says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Um, so that's just a direct contradiction, right? Those can't be true. You can't have a body, you can't have a spirit. Um, another one is in the Pearl of Great Price. It describes acts of creation of multiple gods. It says, and they went down at the beginning, and they, that is, the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. Um, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, for there is one God, and there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Jesus Christ, he himself, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So, is there one God, or is there multiple gods? You can't have both, right? Um, and I think I have one more here. Um, oh, yeah, um, certain prophets, such as Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, so even though these aren't written in their text, as we talked about before, the prophets are actually speaking the word of God, so they can't be fallible, they're kind of like the Pope in that way. Yeah. Um, so Brigham Young said that, and Joseph Smith, both claimed that God was a man once. Mm -hmm. And um, Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. So how can you have a God that was God, and then was, or was a man and then turned into God? You know, that doesn't work out either. So yeah. we just have direct contradictions. Brigham Young was especially crazy. Like, if you want some real <laughs> good uh, start a war with a Mormon fuel, t uh -huh. just talk about Brigham Young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, anyway. so, so does anyone have questions on that? Open canon? Okay, so on to the next topic. Yeah, go uh, they believe in a sort of modified universalism, also what we would call pluralism. Um, there are four possible destinations that you go in the afterlife. Um, they have the highest of these, which is called the celestial kingdom of heaven. And this is where you go if you're a Christian, you, you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been baptized, and you have been married. If you haven't been married, then you don't get into the celestial kingdom. That's right, I remember that. Uh, then there's the terrestrial, terrestrial, ter terrestrial kingdom. <laughs> That is the second highest kingdom in heaven, and you go there if you've been uh, saved, uh, a.k.a. you believe in Jesus Christ and you've been baptized. So they believe that water baptism is necessary for salvation. It's a uh, saving sacrament of sorts, or, or ordinance. Uh, and then there's the telestial kingdom of heaven, which they say is also sometimes referred to as hell in the Bible, but not always hell. Um, and this is, they commonly refer to as spirit prison. You go here if you're not a believer. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, there is the second death mentioned in Revelation, the lake of fire and sulfur, or as they call it, fire and brimstone, as the KJV translates it. Mm -hmm. And they say uh, the devil and his angels go there, but also apostates go there. So if you were a part of the Mormon church and then you leave the Mormon church uh, and, um, how would they put it, like, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you go uh, to the lake of fire and sulfur. So... Yeah. Um, so for Christians, I, I imagine that most of us are probably what we call exclusivists. Um, that would be the historical view. The Catholics took it for a very long time, and I'd say probably 90% 90, 90 plus of Protestants take that as well. Um, there, so if you go back to all the church fathers, Augustine, you know, uh, Ir Irenaeus, all those guys, um, all would be exclusivists, okay? The only one, only notable person that you could say that would have been some sort of pluralism would have been C.S. Lewis. Um, mm -hmm. He was, he kind of believed that there might be a second chance for you to go to heaven after you um, yeah. did. But and and that's another thing that I kind of forgot to mention. The Mormon mm -hmm. Church believes after you die, should you go to the spirit prison, you do have the ability to oh, right. take the ordinances and be at least granted uh, access to the terrestrial kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's other like weird details like. If you died as, as an infant, but you would have taken all the ordinances and gotten married uh, on earth had you not died, then they believe you go to the celestial kingdom. So, so there's like some if God sees in the future of the child as if he didn't die, and then... Like, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't question that, you know. Just let's mess up. Well, that's the point where they have to keep coming up with anything that gets questioned about it. They have to make up new things to... Yeah. Well, and they have that liberty to do it, you know, because yeah. they can speak the word of God, which is quite interesting. Yeah. 
that one in particular came from a vision that Joseph Smith had of his, I believe, like one of, like his infant brother or something like that having died, oh, really? and he had a vision of his infant brother being in the celestial kingdom, and so he inferred. Oh, okay. gotcha. from it, so. Interesting. Mm. So take that with what you want. So, <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> universal pluralism. The difference between the two is universalism is that everyone gets to go to heaven. Um, the great theologian Oprah Winfrey believes this. So, <laughs> don't call so, her great. Uh, <laughs> her show ended. She's that's not great. Not great. <laughs> So uh, I'm not even kidding you. Like my theology textbook where I study these, that's what it says. It's like open for <laughs> universalism. So pluralism, CSLS, and exclusivism would be like the church. Um, so so it, it's like, exclusivism that you die once and then there's a judgment. And then there's a judgment. Yeah. yeah. So the reason why these are so attractive is from our perspective, these seem very harsh. Um, probably as 21st century Christians, we believe that. I think we would look at that differently for throughout most of human history. But um, the, in reality, it doesn't really matter how we feel about this. Uh, as Christians, we go back to the Bible for a source of truth. And in the Bible, it seems very, I, I would say it seems uh, specific enough to where we can call these heresies. Um, yeah. to, to read a couple verses on this, we have um, Romans 10, 9 through 11 says that if you confess your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, for, on, or for one believes with the heart and is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth is so saved. Right? This is binary. You, you are saved or you are not saved. And it doesn't matter how much we want to believe otherwise. It seems like this is what the Bible says. So C.S. Lewis, like I said, is a very, very brilliant person, and I'm sure he has some decent arguments for pluralism. From my perspective, and I would, I, when I say my perspective, I, I think I'm talking about most of the church, would say that feels like he's trying to work this idea into the Bible rather than pulling that out of the Bible. So, um, yeah, like I said, these ones are much harder heresies. This one, there's a little bit of wiggle room, not quite as much as some of the other ones we'll see as well. So, go. Cool. Uh, oh, and were there any questions about any of those topics? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, this one uh, continued. They get less and, well, I don't know about less and less heretical, but uh, <laughs> some of these are just weirder. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the first one, pre-existence. They believe in a pre-mortal existence that everyone was a spirit, children of God the Father and the spirit mother that existed eternally and then part of the creation story. And that's why we entered mortal existence is to become closer to him and that by being mortal, we can eventually become eternal, not simply uh, eternal as we were before, but eternal also in likeness as God. So, And don't they like become one like with God? Almost, like, yeah, it, there, there's a little bit of that um, because Jesus is of sorts our spirit brother in their mm -hmm. view uh, and because he is has inherited all the traits and attributes of God the Father, uh, they believe we have the ability to do that as well. Um, Interesting. So. So, are we like Jesus then? Uh, yes, except we've sinned. <laughs> That's what they would say? Yeah. Oh, interesting. And so, um, Jesus, and also Jesus being the firstborn of all of that stuff, has like a more pri privileged uh, position. It's weird to break out their theology because they don't just explicitly say a lot of yeah. this stuff, so you have to either infer it from what has been said and then go read along further to find out that, no, they would disagree with that some summation, but yeah. So, we, so okay, sorry, it's because he like the first child. That's why he didn't sin. So I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Do you find in your research that um, like you have people come out of the Mormon Church and then reveal what the true or do you? Uh, I didn't do much of that. Most of my research was from the horse's mouth try to understand mm -hmm. what they would claim about their theology, uh, especially because they are so authoritative in the church. Mm -hmm. If you go to someone who's left, uh, that would basically be just going to someone who's going to say heresies about what the Mormon church themselves believes. And so I'd rather stick with what they themselves have, have stated and like yeah. what the, their, uh, their sources say. So I, I do think that's a good point, though, um, just kind of on a side note about um, specifically Christianity um, I guess just Christianity, really, to me, seems to be the only religion that isn't very culty, really not very culty at all. 
that we, we have tight-knit communities like this church, but you can leave this church and you're going to be fine. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, it's not like we create your entire world right here and that's all you have. Um, you're always allowed to leave. But in religions like Mormonism and Islam and even Judaism, um, yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah Catholicism. Witnesses. Catholicism, right, yeah. yeah. A lot of people, like, I have a Catholic friend that, um, we got we got him baptized, so he's uh, <laughs> take that hope. But um, he, <laughs> but he, uh, he's he's a great guy. But he had no idea what he believed in Christianity, and the only reason he didn't want to leave Catholicism was because of his family. And his family had no idea why they believed in Catholicism, right? So yes. you get a lot of that. Um, and I think here, like you're saying, people that leave, I don't think people leave much. You know, from what I can tell, um, I mean, people do, but. It's a sad reality of it. It's almost more like a cult. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate it. It's not just what we would call the GGF. I, I think there's, in a lot of evangelical religions, it really is like you're going to be held, you're going to stand before God with your judgment. And mm -hmm. here is how we view the Bible, but you have to make that decision. The expectation yeah. is on you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. And that really is a, what draws me to. Um, kind of a semi-denomination like the GGF, right. because it's, it's, I think as a whole, it's kind of like, prove it. Pro yeah. Prove it through scripture, mm -hmm. your point. And I'm open to it, but if I don't see that connection, then you're not right. going to convince me. That, that, that's a healthier place to be. Right, yeah, I think especially with our beliefs, it should be highly intellectual. I don't think emotion has much of a place in that. I think there's a great place for emotion within your personal relationship, because your relationship is one of the great things that God has created. But when we're talking about our beliefs, comes back to the Bible, right? I mean, you, you can see how far it can get off on um, getting words from God or these sorts of things here. So, yep. um, sorry, that was a side tangent. So, to answer your question about like people who left, the vast majority of people who left are those, so Mormonism has kind of broken down in the most recent centuries um, because they started fighting about each other because of persecution. So those in Idaho are more the people that are very true traditionalists, Joseph Smith, uh, polygamy, uh, all that stuff, multiple wives, and then the more modern is, has disowned polygamy. So the people that leave Mormonism are usually the ones that are children of polygamist families because it's very cultish, there's a lot of abuse um, and stuff like that. Like the dads will have kids with their own kids and stuff like that. So a lot of those kids end up leaving. Um, but those in the more modern version of Mormonism usually stay. Hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, to clarify that point, after Joseph Smith was murdered, um, there was a secession crisis where people weren't sure who their next leader should be. Eventually that became Brigham Young and then that's the mainstream uh, Mormon Church, what is most commonly known as uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of, of the Latter-day Saints. There are like four or five other sects of that, which are all like, most of them are less than 50,000 people, and then there's one that has about 200,000 members in it, uh, and including one that believes it is the direct line from Joseph Smith. That's like their leader is whoever Joseph Smith's descendant is. That's like exactly like so, yeah. the Pope. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there. I mean, without even knowing all that personally myself, this system is set up to fracture. That's what happens. Right. Yeah. yeah. You don't have like this is truth, and this truth doesn't change. Of course, that's going to keep fracturing. Cause yeah, you're right. Everybody wants power is going to create new truth. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, exactly. Yeah. You know, that's right. Yeah. So. Okay, um, yeah, personal communication trumps scripture. As we've talked about before, the Mormon Church holds up the president and all the other apostles as prophets who have been called by God to speak for him on behalf of God. Uh, and so if God has a new revelation, that could just happen yeah. whenever at, uh, at their pleasure. I've also heard on that one that if you're Mormon, you're supposed to pray to like hear God to get actually new revelation in your day-to-day -day life as well, which is the difference between a yeah. Protestantism and that as well. Um, other interesting ones, the fall, for example, so they believe that uh, the fall made it possible for Adam and Eve to have children. If uh, sin had not entered the world, then it, they would have remained in such a state of innocence that they could not have even had uh, children, which is interesting. Wow, and also, they take kind of a uh, uh, reformed theology approach to 
pain and misery uh, by saying that joy is not possible without misery, um, which is an interesting statement as well. So then uh, the atonement, Jesus not only suffered for our sins, but also suffered all the sicknesses and infirmities of all the people out of the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, once again, this is not like a necessarily a strict, strict heresy. It's really just something they read into the Bible that isn't there. Um, finally, apostasy. Uh, some of us would probably feel a lot stronger about this. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, they claim all apostates go to the uh, lake of fire, um, which is a, a distinctly different end than if you're simply not a believer. If you're not a believer, you go to spirit prison, which isn't great, but it's not that bad. Whereas the lake of fire and brimstone is like you're burning oh. in hell forever. So maybe so. that answers part of the question of why there aren't more people leaving. That's quite a... <laughs> yeah, it's quite a consequence for leaving the Mormon church, right? So um, any questions about those? Okay, cool. And then there's a lot, by the way. So uh, the Mormon church believes they are the only uh, church that has been, um, how would I put it, uh, ordained or given authority by Jesus Christ to uh, oh, like the Catholics. be on this earth. Kind of like the Catholics, yeah. So they <laughs> claim the in a lot of keep, yeah, keep going yeah. back there, don't we? <laughs> they claim an exclusive uh, right over all of that. And then obviously polygamy, uh, that was instituted during Joseph Smith's uh, time. And I'm talking more specifically about the uh, the modern Mormon church, or I should say the main, main, mainstream, yeah, mainstream. Um, uh, Mormon church, that ended in the 1890s mm -hmm. as a result of an act from Congress that made it illegal. And then they had a uh, proclamation that was given out and then it was sustained by all the other apostles, aka it's basically the word of God, mm -hmm. that polygamy is no more a thing. Their original rationale for this was that um, they claimed God gave uh, like Jacob and David and uh, um, other people, other notable figures in the Bible uh, that God commanded them to take on multiple wives. Yeah. Uh, and so that was their rationale is should God command you to take on an additional wife, you can. Um, and it kind of became a thing where they wouldn't if they wouldn't like let you take on a second wife if you didn't feel like super strongly that God was telling you specifically. But at the same time, they weren't overly scrutin yeah. scrutinizing it. Yeah. I know so. that um, like when you say the, fun, the the main church doesn't believe this, there is what's called the FLDS, which is the Fundamental Latter Day Saints, mm -hmm. um, which they actually deny exist in a lot of places. But there's been some like, serial killings that have taken place with them because um, they're very very radical and they still practice that as well. Yeah. Um, um, or two wives. Yeah, that's, that's a real question. So what are you do? <laughs> well, so uh, my uh, my mother-in-law actually sent me a text because I was talking with her about this earlier. She sent me a text uh, where Mark Twain was talking with a Mormon about this and about polygamy, and the Mormon said, "Hey, tell me in the Bible where it says polygamy is wrong." And Mark Twain said, uh, "A man cannot serve two masters." <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Um, should we just skip to the end? Yeah, we should just skip to the end. So, similarities, they believe the Bible, but they have really weird interpretations on it, and they believe that it's been corrupted, kind of. Um, problem of sin, uh, God hates sin, everyone is guilty of it, but, uh, um, you know, God provided a way through Jesus Christ, and Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Um, so there's, and then they have a very strong family focus as far as they want everyone to, you know, uh, families to be built in, you know, uh, multi-parent households. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> and, multi -parent uh, households. yeah, and, and such. So, um, there's so in a that. shallow discussion with someone, it, you feel like you're talking the same language. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The Bible. Yeah, we believe yeah, they're often intelligent yeah, exactly. and come from good families. Well trained. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So people. yeah, conclusions. Is it compatible? Where do we draw the line? And then how do we evangelize them? So yeah, we got to go kind of quick here. Yeah, I, I think maybe we just go to this one because we kind of covered it's not compatible. Yeah. Evangelism specifically, it's very important to remember that they do not just believe in the Bible alone. Right? Mm -hmm. So maybe things like contradictions are better places to go. Um, yep. But ultimately, like we said, to make someone believe in something is has a lot less usually to do with intellectualism than it has to do with something of the heart. So uh, be careful if you go into these conversations with people like this. Yeah, yeah, for so. sure.
for sure. If you have anything. Um, yeah, it ultimately comes down to the heart of God as they see it versus the heart of God as the Bible teaches it. Um, a lot of those things line up, right? Especially, you know, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the salvation provided by God. Um, but a lot of it doesn't line up, and it's those sort of things where it's like, well, you know, plural marriage, why are we trying to do this when God created the perfect marriage in Adam and Eve, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, that's obviously not that relevant to most uh, Mormons nowadays, but, um, or the Trinity, et cetera. Um, definitely those sort of things where you speak, try to speak to the heart of their belief, um, rather not than only, wrong. yeah, yeah, <laughs> rather than just say you're wrong, right? So it's one of those things is... Would you start with the part where they believe it's works-based and their religion yeah. is a lot based on works? That, that would be, that would potentially be a good way to go. Um, another way is really just talking about their history, where they get their information from, where they get the Book of Mormon from, how reliable is it, what are the predictions that, that it makes, right? Mm -hmm. How does its character line up with what the Bible teaches? All of those things tend to uh, present a picture of something that's been added on as opposed to something that's rock bottom foundation. Also, I find it helpful when I'm talking to people that are skeptical um, to ask questions instead of to tell them what's true. So yeah. yeah. The Socratic method, I think, works quite well because then they have to explain to you what they believe. Yeah, and with something like Mormonism, there's a lot more. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah, that is, that is a great point, right? Because mm -hmm. if someone does truly believe this, but they're having difficulty explaining what they believe, mm -hmm. that almost shines a light on the reality of their own faith. Yeah. Um, and the issues to themselves, maybe even more than, uh, than what it was. So. Yeah. Cool. Sorry we went a little long today. Does anyone have any questions? Comments? Like and subscribe. Subscribe on our YouTube page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to share. Don't forget to like, share. Yeah. I don't even think that's on YouTube. So. <laughs> cool. All right. We done then. Cool.